Thanks so much. Uh, I've had some wonderful opportunities to interact with uh, many students here and faculty. Uh, have such um, uh, respect and, and, and joy with what God is doing here on this campus. Some amazing things going on. And um, if you were here last time in chapel a couple days ago, I talked about the unexpected adventure of the Christian faith. You know, Jesus told us to be salt and light. He said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand so it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine among others, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So Jesus, as we said on Tuesday, Jesus was saying, you know, if you're going to be my follower, I want you to live lives like salt that make people thirst for God. I want you to live lives that are like light, that shine my message of hope and grace and love and redemption and eternal life, that shine that message into dark areas of despair. And we talked about what that looks like in a practical way in our everyday life. It is the unexpected adventure. You never know what's going to happen if you're living on that evangelistic edge. You never know what's going to happen. could start out to be an average and routine day. But God might bring an opportunity into your life to have a conversation that could change someone's eternity. In fact, I was just meeting with some students before I came over here, and I was telling them the story about an unexpected adventure I had a few years ago. Uh, you know, I had lived a, a wild and a drunken and a an, uh, uh, narcissistic, uh, self-absorbed life as an atheist when I was legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. And then God got a hold of my life, changed my life. I became a pastor at a church in Chicago. And so one day I was uh, with one of our elders and one of our staff people, and I said, would you be interested in us going downtown Chicago, and I'll show you where my office was and where I used to cover all the major trials in Chicago, the political corruption trials and the crime syndicate cases. They said, yeah, that'd be fun. So it was an average and routine day. We go down to the federal courthouse. We take the elevator up to the 21st floor where my office was at the press room. And the doors of the elevator open up, and there standing in front of me in the, in the, in the hallway was a former competitor of mine from many years ago from another news organization in Chicago. He was a competitor when I was at the Chicago Tribune. And he's one of these tough Chicago reporters. He's got the cigar, but you don't light it. You just gnaw on it, you know. And he, he sees me. He says, Strobel, how the blank are you, son of a blankety blank? I said, I'm doing good. He said, I haven't seen you in years. Are you still working for that blankety blankety Chicago Tribune, that blankety blankety piece of blankety blank? I said, actually, John, I've had a big change in my life. I've become a Christian, and I'm a pastor now. And he looked at me. It was like the cigar almost fell out of his mouth. And he looked at me, and he says, well, I'll be damned. And I said, well, John, you don't have to be. <laughs> and God gave me the opportunity to share the gospel with him. I didn't know that was going to happen. I didn't know I'd get to share the gospel with this guy I hadn't seen in years. Started out an average and routine day. That's the unexpected adventure of the Christian life. So we talked about how that looks, you know, in our individual lives. But I want to shift today, and I want to talk about how can our churches in the 21st century be salt and light to a culture that's increasingly skeptical and hostile toward the Christian message? All of you here, in one way or the other, are going to be leaders of the church of the future. You're going to be senior pastors. You're going to be uh, working on church staffs. You're going to be volunteers. You're going to be deacons. You're going to be elders. You're going to be involved in shaping the church of Jesus Christ in the coming years. And I want to talk to you on that level today because I am very concerned about the state of the church in America. I have a, a, a fear, and that fear is that the value and the practice of evangelism is dissipating in far too many American churches. I mean, we all know of churches that are growing. They've got great teaching. They've got great worship. But here's my question. Are we seeing atheists walk in the door and ultimately walk out the door of our churches as missionaries? Are we doing that? Are we turning irreligious people 
into fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ? Are we consistently seeing large numbers of spiritually confused people find God and seeing their lives and eternities revolutionized? Here's the truth. It takes 86 church members working one year to lead one person to Jesus Christ in America. 86 church members working one year to lead one person to Christ. I mean, at that rate, we're not going to change the world. We're not going to change the nation. At that rate, we're going to go extinct. No wonder the 60% of Protestant churches in America are either plateaued or declining. No wonder that more than half of the churches in America saw fewer than 10 conversions last year. Tom Rayner, the researcher from Lifeway, put it this way, American church growth is typically the transfer of members from one congregation to another rather than the conversion of the lost. This is a serious situation. How are we going to be salt and light through our churches in the 21st century to lead more and more people to faith in Jesus Christ? I think there's answers to that question. I think the answers are found in this book. Uh, my ministry associate, Mark Middleberg, and I have worked for years on this topic, and he's actually reduced what I'm going to talk about today um, and expands upon it in a book that he wrote called Building a Contagious Church. But I'm going to kind of summarize um, what it is that we can do as leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ to increase the evangelistic effectiveness of local churches. What can we do to make our churches stronger salt? and brighter light in the 21st century. Well, there's a six-stage process that my buddy Mark, uh, Mark writes about in his book, and it works to increase the evangelistic effectiveness of churches. And you know why it works? Because it's biblical. And we've seen it. We've had it tested how uh, churches that apply this six-stage process have ended up growing in reaching people for Christ. So I want to walk through that process for you. Um, and I hope it's something that you, as you go out into the various ministries that God has called you to, that you'll apply these principles in whatever church you find yourself a part of. Six stages in this process. The first stage is this, leaders of churches. By that, I mean senior pastors, staff members, elders, leaders of churches must own and model the value that lost people matter to God. Leaders of churches must model the value that lost people matter to God. One of the biggest reasons that churches are less evangelistic these days is because its leaders are less evangelistic and values are not just taught, they're also caught. Tom Rader did a survey and he found out that over half of pastors, 53% of pastors, have made no personal evangelistic efforts at all in the previous six months. They have not shared the gospel. They have not attempted to engage a lost or unchurched person at any level. I mean, friends, as they say in business, speed of the leader, speed of the team. The truth is, if you're a leader of a church, if you're a senior pastor of a church, your church, your church will probably be no more effective collectively than you are personally. In other words, you're going to set the high water mark for evangelistic effort and emphasis in that church. But here's the sad reality. Our evangelistic zeal wanes over time. It isn't always at a, a high pitch. We're not always living, you know, with that evangelistic commitment to lead people of faith. We, we, it, it comes and it goes. Our temperature is hot one time and, and lower another time. And so what do we do when we find ourselves as leaders and yet our evangelistic zeal has waned? What can we do? Let me give you some uh, practical things that you can do when, that, when you feel like, I don't care as much. I know the Bible says that God wants everyone to come to repentance, but the truth is today, I'm too busy to care. That's the honest truth. I mean, when we come to that point, what can we do to renew that, ev that evangelistic zeal? Well, here's one thing. We can ask God to renew our heart for the lost. Can you imagine how much God loves answering 
the prayer when we come to him and say, God, my heart's grown cold toward lost people. I don't care as much as I used to care. God, renew my heart for lost people. That is a prayer God loves to answer. Second thing, linger on those passages of Scripture that talk about God's love for lost people. Go to Luke 15 and those three parables that Jesus tells about the value of lost people to God. Go to John chapter, what is it, chapter 5, that talks about the woman at the well and his love for reaching people far from God. So go back to those passages of Scripture that remind us of how much God loves lost people. Hang around contagious Christians. We all know someone in our life who is evangelistically on fire a lot of the time. Have lunch with them. Listen to their stories. When I go to lunch with my buddy Mark Middleberg, uh, who's just a wonderful personal evangelist, and I ask him what's going on in your life, and he tells me about the neighbor that he led to Jesus Christ last week, or he talks about another neighbor that he just baptized in his swimming pool. Um, that fires me up. So have, get together with contagious Christians. Let that rub off a little on you. Uh, another thing we can do is to build in interaction with non-Christians into our calendars. Uh, you don't have to add anything more to your activities. How many of you have an extra couple of hours with nothing to do every week? Yeah, nobody. We're all busy, aren't we? You don't have to add anything additional to your schedule. All you have to do is enfold non-believers into your life. So in other words, you're going to watch the big base basketball game coming up on TV next week. Invite a non-church neighbor to come in and watch it with you. You're going to wash your car. So instead of washing it alone on the driveway, call a neighbor say, hey, pull your car up, we'll wash our cars together. Um, you're going to play golf. Why do we always golf with other Christians? Why can't we invite our non-believing friends to go golfing with us? Whatever you're going to do, just enfold them into things you're going to do anyway. You haven't added one minute of time to uh, your schedule, but you're building on a relationship with an unchurched person. And then to have accountability. Do you have someone in your life who asks you, how are you doing in terms of your um, evangelistic efforts. Are you, are you reaching out to anyone? Are you uh, planning to have lunch with a non-believer? What, what are we doing? If you go on my calendar, on the first day of every month, you'll see two things every day on that first day, every month. The first thing is something to do with my marriage. Because on the first day of every month, I ask myself the same question. How would I like to be married to me? And I ask myself that question, and that helps me think through how can I be a better husband to Leslie. But the other thing I have on my calendar is, who are you getting together with this month who doesn't know Jesus? I mean, am I having lunch with a non-believer? Am I, um, uh, you know, socializing in some way with a non-believer? And if I'm not, it prompts me to get on the phone and to call a friend who doesn't know Christ and say, hey, let's get together. Let's go to Starbucks, have coffee, catch up on things or whatever it is. But if you have that kind of thing on your calendar every month, it helps hold you accountable to being active and, and involved in lives of non-Christians uh, that will increase your evangelistic temperature. But I think it's pivotal that leaders at all levels of churches must own and model this value that lost people matter to God. The second stage in this process of increasing the evangelistic temperature of local churches, the second stage is leaders must instill evangelistic values into the congregation. We've got to figure out ways to instill that value into our congregations. We have to help our people understand that an evangelistic lifestyle is normal for a Christian. That's normal. Um, Leslie and I flew into the airport here, Raleigh-Durham Airport, um, and we're going to fly out right after the service here this morning. Now, if we go to the airport this afternoon and we don't see any people and we don't see any airplanes, nobody's around, nothing's happening, we would say, something's wrong. 
Something is wrong here. Why? Because an airport is built for airplanes to come and go and people to travel around the country. That's what they're there for. It is not normal to have an airport that doesn't have any planes at it. And friends, it is not normal for a fully discipled follower of Jesus Christ to have a consistently cold heart toward lost people. Our desire to reach people with the gospel should grow over time because as we become more like the master, we should embrace and and reflect his values. His mission was to seek and save the lost. Um, A fully devoted follower of Christ should increasingly over time have a soft heart and a high passion for reaching the lost. If you have someone in your church who's sitting in a pew for 15 years and he doesn't give a rip about lost people, that's not normal. That's not right. Something is wrong. And so we as church leaders have to instill this value of evangelism into our congregation. How do we do that? We do it through formal means, things like preaching, uh, to preach through. By the way, it's John chapter 4, isn't it? The Samaritan uh, woman at the well. I think I said 5 earlier. Um, but um, to preach through these passages, Luke 15, John 4, and other passages, uh, to instill that value. We do it through small group curriculum that we choose for our churches and through seminars, all kinds of things. But one of the most effective ways that we instill this value, value is informally. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was in a small group with a pastor for uh, several years, and he had a big heart for lost people. And one day he came in, it was right before Easter, and he was all upbeat and excited, and we said, hey, what's going on? He said, well, you know, every day on my way into the church, I stop at the same bakery and I buy a blueberry muffin. And because I go to the same place every day, I've gotten to know the baker, the guy who owns the bakery. And so now that we've been doing this for many months, we ask about each other's families and we're, we, we know quite a bit about each other. He's not a Christian. And he said, today, I asked him to come to Easter services at our church and he said he would come. Now, what he did was very strategic. He didn't shame me and say, hey, who are you inviting to Easter services? Um, he just said, this is what's going on in my life and I'm excited about it, and I'm grateful to God for it. Well, what did that do for me? It made me ask myself, well, what am I doing? Who am I reaching out to? Who am I building relationships with? What businesses am I consistently uh, patronizing so I can get to know the owner, so I can invite him to church? It's these subtle things that we can informally instill this value that lost people matter to God through prayers that we pray before a deacon's meeting or, or um, uh, conversations in the hallway of the church. Those things can go a long way toward um, uh, instilling the evangelistic value in others. Um, By the way, I think it helps if you're going to be a leader of a church and you do not have a spiritual gift of evangelism. I know there's a controversy. Is there a spiritual gift of evangelism? Let's just say there's a lot of people who uh, seem to have a divine enablement when it comes to evangelism, right? Um, I think it's to your advantage if you don't have that. Because if if you're a, a, a gifted and a natural evangelist who just can't stop sharing their faith, People say, oh, yeah, that's Jim, that's Nancy, that's them, They're, that's how they are, that's their gift, that's not me. But if we don't, if we struggle with this stuff, if it's not easy for us, and we get up before the congregation and say, yeah, this stuff isn't easy for me, uh, but I've been building a relationship with the baker, and, and I've gotten to know him, and I've invited him, and he's coming. I mean, people can relate to that because most people uh, find that they struggle with reaching out to others with the gospel as well. So I think it's to your advantage if this is not easy for you. Okay, first step. Leaders must own and model the value lost people matter to God. Second, we need to instill that value in the congregation. And then third comes, I think, the most revolutionary part of this process. Third, leaders must empower a point person to lead the evangelistic charge. Every church in America in the world needs a point person for evangelism. What do I mean by that? I have a friend named Carl. 
Carl's a very successful businessman. And one day, Carl said to me and to Mark, he said, you know, to be successful in business, you'd only, you only have to do two things right. I said, really? What are those two things? First, you need to uh, keep your present customers happy. And then second, you need to find new customers. It's all you have to do in business. If you do those two things, you're going to be successful. And then he looked at us. He said, now, in your church, who's in charge of new business? It's a good question. I bet if you leave this service today and you um, call a local church at random and you get the receptionist and you say, who's your senior pastor? Oh, that's Dr. Bob Smith. Great guy. Okay, great. Who's your children's pastor? Oh, that's Nancy Jones. She's terrific. Okay, great. Who's your worship leader? Oh, that's Bob whatever. He's a great guy too. Okay, who's in charge of evangelism? Oh, hmm. Well, golly. Um, that's kind of, Nancy does a bit of that in women's ministries, and, 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 and yeah, well, I'm not exactly sure. Friends, nothing gets done in the local church unless there's a name assigned to it. Every church needs a person, whether they're volunteer, part-time, or full-time, that is solely devoted to new business, to reaching the community for Christ under the leadership of the senior pastor. Uh, this is the missing link, the missing person in effective evangelism. Be why? Because the pastor has many values that he needs to uphold. When he's teaching, he needs to, sure, he needs to teach on the value of evangelism, but guess what? He also has to teach on the value of stewardship and on the value of community and the value of prayer and at the value of Bible study and all these different values. And when he preaches on evangelism, guess what? The evangelistic temperature of the church goes up. But then he has to switch gears, and next series he's going to teach on stewardship, and the evangelistic temperature goes down. We need a point leader, a man or woman who stays up late at night praying and thinking and strategizing, how is our church going to penetrate this community for Jesus Christ? I think that's the missing link in evangelism effectiveness of local churches. Um, evangelism, that value leaks away faster than any other value because it's, it's not about us, it's about someone else. And when churches have a meeting, a business meeting, and they're deciding how to divide up the budget, and all these ministries are vying for budget dollars, guess who's not at the table? The lost guy who lives down the block. He's not at that table saying, hey, hello, I'm out here. I'm headed for hell. What are you doing for me? What are you going to do to reach me? He's not there. So we need someone to embody that value, to represent the lost, to be in those decision-making uh, meetings, to uh, champion the value that lost people matter to God. I think this is, this is key. This is why uh, we've started our new Center for Evangelism and Applied Apologetics at Colorado Christian University to um, create these evangelism point leaders. And some of you, through your education here, you're going to be equipped. Maybe God will call you to be a point leader of a local church in evangelism. I had three churches recently call me up and say, I, we have got full-time jobs ready and available for evangelism point people. We don't know where to find them. Maybe that could be God's calling on your life. Uh, so, uh, I, I, I think this is incredibly important. And, and it's incredibly important what kind of person fills this role. Because guess what? Every church has an evangelism enthusiast who's weird. Can we be honest? I call him Evangelism Eddie. And he dresses a little weird, and he always wants to go out and ring doorbells of people that, and, and try to share Jesus with them. And he's trying to drag everybody to the mall to pass out tracts. But he's a little odd, and nobody really wants to be like Eddie, to be honest. Friends, that's not your evangelism point leader. 
The evangelism point leader should be a leader, someone who knows how to organize and inspire and, 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 uh, people on a cause. And uh, Eddie can have a role, absolutely, but we need a leader who's gifted in leadership to take this mantle of being the evangelism point leader of the church. So what does this person do? What's their role? What, what's their responsibilities? That comes to stage four. First stage, leaders must own and model the value of the lost people matter to God. Second stage, they need to instill that value into the congregation. Third stage, we need a point person, volunteer, full-time or part-time, at every church to lead the evangelistic charge. By the way, don't weight down that person with a bunch of extraneous activities they need to do. Don't say, yeah, you're in charge of evangelism and discipleship and weddings and this and that and the other thing. No, it should be a pure job, pure responsibilities in evangelism. But what do they do? That's the fourth stage. Leaders must make sure that 100% of their congregation is trained to naturally and effectively share their faith. And both words are important. We need to train everybody in the church how to naturally and effectively share their faith. Both words are important because we want them to do this in a natural way, a way that syncs up with how God made them to be. Because you can force someone to stand on a street corner and pass out tracks for a Sunday afternoon, but they're not going to do that consistently if it's not consistent with their personality and how God made them up to be. We have to help people discover, what is your personality? What, what, you know, uh, what do you like? And how can God use you in a way that's consistent with your personality to reach people for Christ. I remember when I was a new Christian, I uh, became a Christian in Chicago, um, and Leslie came up to me one day and said, man, I just read something in the Bible. She said, it says, you should pray for the desires of your heart. I said, come on. She said, no, I'm serious. Said, okay, well, I want to run a newspaper. That's what I wanted to do. I was just legal editor at the Chicago Tribune. I wanted to run a newspaper. Well, within 30 days, God answered that prayer. And we moved away to be editor of a newspaper, the top editor at a small newspaper in Missouri. So first thing I did, go in the yellow pages back then and look up the local Baptist church. Great. Went to the church, joined the church. And I was in Sunday school class one day. And the leader of the class, who was a, a lay person, um, at the end of the class said, hey, um, after class today, Sunday afternoon, I'm going to go out into the neighborhoods around the church and I'm going to knock on doors of random people and try to invite them to church next week. And if you love Jesus, you'll come with me. And I'm thinking, I love Jesus, I think, but I don't want to go knock on doors of strangers. Honestly, that's not, that's not how God wired me up to be. I mean, I, I mean I'm personally kind of an introvert. Um, I don't want to do that. Now, does that mean I hate Jesus? No, it just means, you know what? That's a style of evangelism that fit that guy. God bless him. But it doesn't fit everybody. We're all a little different. You don't have to do it like I do it. I don't have to do it like you do it, as long as we do it. And so there are at least six different styles of evangelism the Scripture talks about. I'll go through them real quickly, but uh, you may know these. I don't know. The first one is the direct style. And the example is Peter in Acts chapter 2, who gets up and, and confronts people. Um, some people are like that. They're extroverted. They're, um, they're willing to talk to strangers and, and challenge them like that, like my friend who wanted to go knock on doors of strangers. God bless them. But not everybody has a direct style. Second style, the intellectual style. That's Paul on Mars Hill, where he's reasoning with people. Some people are apologists. They love to give evidence and reasons for the faith. That syncs up more with who I am, and so that's a style that I tend to use. Third style, the testimonial style. That's the blind man in John chapter 9, who, when he is healed by Jesus, goes in front of the, the leaders, uh, the, the, the Jewish leaders, and, and does he confront them like Peter? 
No. Does he reason with them like Paul? No. He says, look, I was once blind, now I see. Deal with it. It's a testimonial style. Some people are really good at sharing their testimony. This is, I, sh- I, I combine two styles, a testimonial style and the um, intellectual style. And I go all around the world and I do the same thing all the time and I never get tired of it because it, it syncs up with who God made me to be. I tell my story. I was an atheist. Here's the consequences of living that lifestyle. Here's why I began investigating Christianity. Here's the evidence I encountered. Here's how I reached the verdict for Christ. Here's how I gave my life to him. Here's how he's changed my life. It's my testimony with the evidence added. And God is blessed. I use that all over the planet. But I use it because that's who, that syncs up with my personality. Might not for yours, but it does for me. The um, fourth style is the relational style. Some people are really good about building relationships quickly and with, with, with people, and, and uh, God can use that style. Um, um, and the biblical style there is Matthew in, in Luke chapter 5. Matthew, this tax collector, what's the first thing he does after he gets saved? He throws a party. He says, I'm going to invite Jesus and the disciples and, 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 and my non-believing tax collecting friends, and we're going to rub shoulders and spiritual sparks are going to fly. It's a relational style. Some have the invitational style. This is the woman at the well in John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman, who when she realizes Jesus is the Messiah, what does she do? She runs into town. Does she reason with people? No. Does she confront them? No. Does she tell her story? Not really. She just says, hey, come hear this guy. He might be the Messiah. It's an invitational style. Some people are really good at inviting people to Christian concerts or to church or whatever. And then six, the serving style. Um, this is illustrated by Dorcas in Acts chapter 9, who made clothing for widows um, and poor people in her neighborhood. And through that, she had a spiritual influence. In fact, she was so influential spiritually that when she died, God sent apostles to raise her from the dead. So there's a benefit to having this style. If you've got the you know, serving style, it could be good. But some people serve others not instead of sharing Jesus with them, but as a way of sharing Jesus with them. So there's different styles. Once we help people recognize what style they have, then we can encourage them to use that style, that approach, to reach people for Christ. I'll give you an example. We had a woman named Julie Harney. Uh, We were doing some teaching on this topic at a seminar. Julie had never shared her faith before. She was a painfully introverted person. But she, but she came to our training. She realized, even though she's introverted, she's really good one-on-one in relationships. And we said, we think you have the relational style. So we helped her develop that style. Well, guess what? Within one year, using that relational style, Julie Harney led 14 people to faith in Jesus Christ. A woman who'd been on the sidelines who'd never shared her faith because she thought, I got to be an extrovert and stand on a street corner. I got to hand out tracts at the shopping center. No, you can use your style, your relational style. People like Julie Harney will change the world through one slice of pie and one cup of coffee at a time through relationships. And so the first task of this evangelism point leader, let's train everybody in the church how to naturally and effectively share their faith. So, leaders must own and model the value of lost people matter to God. We've got to instill that value in the congregation. We need a point leader for every single church that's going to lead the evangelistic charge. Not do evangelism instead of the congregation, but he's going to, number four, train the whole congregation to do evangelism with him or um, motivate them to do it. The fifth stage is that leaders must unleash those who are gifted or passionate about evangelism. Leaders must unleash those who are gifted or passionate about evangelism. There's a dispute or a controversy in the church. Is evangelism a spiritual gift? I don't really care one way or the other because the truth is uh, God does give a divine enablement of some sort. There are some people, you know some of them, I'm sure, who just naturally um, exude evangelistic values. Well, they're going to lead more people to faith 
than the average Christian. So we ought to be doing something to harness them and encourage them and motivate them and use them in the course of the local church. But their numbers have been shrinking. Over the last 15 years, the number of gifted evangelists in local churches has shrunk by 75%. It's down to 1%. So if you have a church of 200 people, there's probably two people who really have this, this divine enablement to lead people to faith. Um, well, they have a disproportionate impact, and so let's build into them. Let's, let's harness that um, spiritual energy uh, for God's glory. Um, so what I think a lot of churches make the mistake at is they say, okay, we've got four or five, six people like that in our church. Let's bring them together into an evangelism ministry and segregate them into the basement of the church. I think that's a mistake. I think what we ought to do is keep them in the women's ministry, in the men's ministry, in the children's ministry, all through the ministries of the church. Because we need evangelists, uh, white hot evangelists in every aspect of the church. But let's bring them together maybe three to five times a year on a Saturday morning and give them some special training, some special encouragement. Um, some further equipping, and then send them back into the women's ministry, into the student ministry, into the men's ministry, because this is what we do in Texas when we barbecue. When you barbecue in Texas, you get a pile of barbecue briquettes, right? And you light them on fire, and they get white hot. But you don't leave them like that. You spread them out. Well, we have to bring these gifted evangelists together periodically, fire them up, and send them back into the various ministries of the church where they can be salt and light as models to other people in various aspects of the church. So, leaders must own a model of the value. Lost people matter to God. We've got to instill that value. We need evangelists appoint leaders who do what? Who train 100% of the congregation and naturally and effectively share their faith. We've got to um, unleash those who are gifted or passionate about evangelism. And then the sixth stage, leaders must create catalytic ministries and events to reach their community for Christ. We need to create catalytic ministries and events to reach their community for Christ. We need to create safe places where Christians can take their spiritually curious friends as part of their evangelistic efforts to reach them for Christ. In other words, most churches, if they train people in evangelism, and a lot don't, but if they do, they get people together, they train them, and they say, go do it, and they send them out. Well, for a gifted evangelist, that's no problem because they have this divine enablement to initiate conversations, answer questions, present evidence, lead people to faith. Uh, like my friend Jay. <laughs> I have one of these friends named Jay. He's a totally gifted evangelist. So one day he's in Chicago, and he had to make a left turn out of a parking lot, and it was raining, and the streets were slick, and the traffic was heavy, and he's waiting for a break in the traffic to make a left turn, and it wasn't coming. Finally, there's a little break. So he slams on his accelerator, makes a left turn, but in the slickness of the rain, his car begins to spin down the highway. So now he's fishtailing and spinning down the highway. Other cars are trying to avoid him. One car goes into a ditch. Everybody's kind of, but nobody crashed into anybody else, but everybody stopped. And Jay got out of his car and looked around. Everybody okay? Everybody, uh-oh, what about this car that went in the ditch? So he goes over into the ditch, and he opens the passenger door, and in the car is a woman, driver, alone in the car, and she's sitting at the driver's, in the driver's seat, and she just, you know, she's, <laughs> this was scary. She, you know, she just had this accident. <laughs> she, she's, so Jay says, are you okay? Are you all right? And she goes, <laughs> Yeah. I think I'm okay. I think I'm all right. And Jay said, if you had died just now, are you sure you would have gone to heaven? I said, Jay, give her a break. She's almost killed herself. Come on. I mean, the only way you'll stop Jay from sharing his faith is to shoot him in the head. That's about the only way you're going to stop him. Um, but he's unusual. He's 1% of the church 
who can do all this on their own. We need to help everybody. How do we do that? To create safe places where we can bring our non-believing friend to be helped in their, your, your evangelism efforts. So in other words, when we design our services at church, we think through, by God's grace, let's hope and pray there's going to be some non-believers among us. And so let's think that through. So when I preach, I want to write my message with that in mind. And if I use a word like sanctification, I want to define it because the non-believer is not going to know what the heck you're talking about. Um, uh, we need to say at worship time, we're going to stand, we're going to worship the Lord. You know what? Some of you are new here, and this may feel a little uncomfortable to you. I just want you to know, why don't you stand with us and Maybe just being in the presence of your neighbors and friends who are expressing their love to God. See, see what God does in your heart. Or, you know, we're going to receive the offering now. Um, this is not for you if you're visiting. This is just for us who are part of this church. If you're visiting, this service is our gift to you. We're so glad you're here. Can we reduce some of the unnecessary barriers that keep non-believers away or uncomfortable when they come to church? Not to water down the message, just to lower the unnecessary cultural barriers to realize there are non-believers among us. Um, we can do target weekends when we let the congregation know, hey, guess what? We're bringing in a, a speaker who's a gifted evangelist. Next Sunday, bring your non-believing friend to come. Um, we can do that. We can do outreach events. A recent study showed that the most successful Baptist churches, the ones that are baptizing the most new believers, the study showed that they not only put on attractional events, but they did several annually, they did them especially well, and they got exceptional results. But, um, so it could be a variety. It could be a, a, um, a, a food pantry. You know, at Saddleback Church, where I was a teaching pastor with Rick Warren, our big harvest weekend was Easter. And we would tell all of our congregation, you know, bring your non-believing friend at Easter because we're going to, the gospel is going to be crystal clear. We're going to call for commitment, um, but it's going to be done in a way that's sensitive to where they're at. So bring them on Easter. And we'll have, you know, 1,800 or 2,000 people come to faith at, uh, every Easter. But did you know in the year 2011, Saddleback Church had more people come to faith through the food pantry than at Easter? through serving other people during an economic downturn where people came and found the love of God tangibly expressed to them. Uh, and, and through that, their heart was softened and they received Christ. It could be a variety of different ministries. We're only limited by our imagination. But if these other five sta stages aren't in place, if people don't have the value to love lost people, if they've not been trained to naturally and effectively reach out and so forth, and you do an outreach event, it's a good chance it's just going to flop. A lot of churches have taken our movie, The Case for Christ, and done an outreach event, just shown the movie. Uh, one church in New Zealand did that. 22 people came to faith at that showing of the film. There's simple things we can do. But my favorite innovation, and I think this is a wave of the future, is small groups for non-believers. Um, we call them spiritual discovery groups. And these are groups where you have a Christian couple, maybe a husband, wife, or a leader and an apprentice, and then half a dozen non-believers who get together on a regular basis, weekly basis for maybe a couple of months to go on a spiritual journey together. These are dynamite. Why? Because members of, the, of Generation uh, Z and, and millennials, young people, love to talk. They love to give their opinions about things. And this provides an opportunity to do that. Um, so I, when I was a pastor in Chicago, I hired a guy named Gary Poole who was doing these kind of groups on a secular college campus at Indiana University with great success. And I said, come to our church and start these groups. He came to our church. Pretty soon we had 1,100 non-believers in these groups. And we tracked them over a period of time. And guess what we found? If a non-believer joins one of these groups and stays in it, 80% come to faith in Christ. 80, where do you get an 80% conversion rate? These groups are dynamite. Um, you don't have to be the Bible answer man or the Bible answer lady. That's not what these groups are about. We teach people how to facilitate a discussion. 
Um, we teach them how not to answer a lot of questions, but to ask a lot of questions and to listen and to respect the other person as someone who matters to God and to validate their spiritual journey. And uh, uh, anybody, anybody can learn how to do these groups. And it is shockingly easy to get non-believers to join these groups. The hardest part of doing this group is shutting them up. Because the group, every meeting is only an hour and 15 minutes. Good luck trying to end that meeting in an hour and 15 minutes. Because once you get these people talking about spiritual stuff, they don't want to stop. I, th- I really believe these groups are the future. I think every church needs to have at least one or a proliferation of these kind of groups um, because God uses them in remarkable ways. If you want to learn how to do these groups or how to organize this kind of ministry at your church, I told Gary for years, write a book about it so we can, and he finally did. And we call these groups spiritual discovery groups, but um, they used to be called Seeker Small Groups, and his book is called Seeker Small Groups by Gary Poole, and you get it on Amazon or um, Christian Books or whatever. But I'm telling you, these groups, I'll give you an example. We had a woman coming to our church who was an atheist. She was mad because her daughter had come to our church and had become a Christian. So she started, the atheist mom started to come. And uh, so she came up to me one day as a pastor, and she said, um, I understand you have groups like, for people like me who don't believe in God. I said, that's right. She said, I want to join one. I said, what's well, great. She said, no, no, you don't understand. I'm just going to join to cause trouble, and I'm going to ask all the embarrassing questions, and I'm going to put the Christian leaders on the spot. I said, okay, I'm glad it's not my group. So... I got her into a group. Six months later, we're doing a baptism service. She comes up to me to be baptized. I almost fell over. I said, what are you doing here? She said, I've received Jesus. I said, whoa, whoa, time out. Last I saw you, you were going to join a group just to cause trouble. What happened? And what she said, I'll never forget. She said, Lee, the Christian couple who led my group loved me even though I was obnoxious. And when I was sick, they brought me chicken soup. And when I was out of town on business and I missed our meeting, they called me up and said, hey, we missed getting together with you. Let's, get, let's go to Starbucks and catch up. They listened to me. They validated me as someone who matters. They loved her into the kingdom of God. That's what these groups are. They're just an excuse to get together to love people. And God uses them powerfully. I think every church needs them. So, how can we increase the evangelistic effectiveness of our churches? When the leaders own and model the value that lost people matter to God, when we instill that value in the congregation so they could say it's normal as a follower of Jesus to care for lost people, when we have a point person who lays up late at night dreaming and praying and uh, scheming about how this church can reach the community for Christ, um, and then we train 100% of the congregation to naturally and effectively share their faith. We harness and unleash the gifted evangelists, and then finally, we, we put on a variety of ministries and outreach opportunities, services and special events and all kinds of stuff, food pantries and small groups for nonbelievers that we can invite people into so they can encounter Jesus. We've seen... In many cases, in fact, we had a Ph.D. dissertation done where a Ph.D. student studied churches that have adopted this six-stage process, and sure enough, the evangelistic effectiveness went up. Why? Because it's all biblical. It's all biblical. So here's my closing challenge or encouragement. I think if one thing happened as part of all this, it would change the church in America. One thing, really. The six stages is important. We've got to do that. But I'll give you one thing, that if every senior leader of a church did this in America, it would transform the evangelistic effectiveness of the American church, and that's this. If every senior pastor built one authentic, caring relationship with a person headed for hell, a pagan who was far from God, and they built a relationship to the point where 
they go on family vacations together, and they, they babysit each other's children, and they go bowling together, and they play golf together, and they, they love each other. They become the best of friends. And it comes to the point where the senior pastor says, wait a minute, my friend is headed for hell. That is intolerable. I cannot let that happen. And so that pastor goes into his church and says, we need to reshape the way we think about evangelism. We really need to reshape the way we do evangelism because i got to reach my friend. I can't allow him to go to hell. That one loving, caring, powerful, personal relationship with a hell-bound pagan, if every pastor had one of those, then they'd look at ministry totally differently and they look at the church totally differently. Their values would be turned upside down, and they would be innovators and risk-takers for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, let me pray. Father, thank you for this group of leaders. We know that each one of them is going to play a role of some sort in your church in the coming years, and we pray that they would infect that church with the virus of evangelism, that they would help increase the evangelistic temperature and effectiveness of whatever body of believers they are part of to reach as many people as we can with your message of grace and hope. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.